Well, hello folks, here we are again on another Sunday morning in quarantine. So uh, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're, you're taking care of yourselves, you're staying healthy, and uh, I hope that sometime here in the relatively near future we'll be able to be together here again in this building and uh, see one another face to face uh, from, from the pews and me from up front here. So I'm really looking forward to when that, that day comes. I do want to say that today I'm going to change what I was talking about a little bit. Uh, I was supposed to talk to you about Genesis, the creation story, and uh, the uh, lectionary text that I was going to work with was uh, discussing royal ancestry. And I have to tell you, I am really struggling this week to, uh, to work on that text, and I've been feeling pulled and, and pushed in another direction. And I typically find that when God puts me in that headspace and makes me not feel good about the thing I had worked on, that it's time to go in a different direction. And so I'm gonna. And I, I have to tell you that the direction I'm gonna go in, I'm a little uncomfortable. I think probably throughout the course of this, if you stick with me all the way to the end, you might be a little bit uncomfortable too. I can't help and I can't not in good conscience talk about what's been going on here recently in our country uh, with the death of George Floyd and everything that surrounded it. I can in good conscience as a Christian pastor stand by and not have a discussion about what the Bible tells us in situations like these, how it is that we should try to react or what can we do in situations like these where there is a clear racial injustice, where a murder clearly happened in front of our eyes. What is it that we do with that information? What is it that we do with the hurt and the pain that we see out of the tens of thousands of peaceful protesters that have taken to the streets wanting to be heard? As Christians who believe that we should love one another, we should take care of one another, we should love our neighbor as ourselves, what is it that we do in a time like this? How is it that we deal with the realities that our brothers and sisters, our brown and black brothers and sisters, live with a different reality than we do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you don't believe me when I make that statement, I'm gonna read some statistics that I found in an article, and I wanna share these with you first so I think that we can then have a better conversation moving forward about where the Bible is in, in, in these instances and what kind of things the Bible tells us to do. I'm also gonna throw in some other uh, quotes from some books that I have, and uh, I have then a little walk through the scripture to get a little look at what scripture says when it comes to working together with people who don't look like us and come from different backgrounds as us. So in 2019, so not very long ago, the Pew Research Center reported that a majority of Americans say race relations in the United States are bad. And of those, about seven in 10 say things are getting even worse. It'd certainly be interesting to see what that research says after what we've seen over the last week. In the generation after the 1954 Brown School desegregation decision, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, racial, racial discrimination continues in our country. According to the FBI, 60% of hate crimes are motivated by race, ethnicity, or ancestry. 60% folks of hate crimes are motivated by race, ethnicity, or ancestry. Now Galatians says this, In Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3, 26 through 28. Folks, I love that scripture, and I have probably quoted that scripture hundreds of times. And you know what? I love that scripture because every time I quote it, it makes me feel good. It gives me hope. It makes me think that, hey, as bad as things are in our world, there's a possibility that everybody's gonna be free. Everybody is equal. Everybody is gonna be able to be treated the same. But folks, 
you just have to look around to see that without some work, this scripture isn't true for everybody who reads it. And me, coming from the place that I am in my life, coming from the ethnicity that I was born into, this scripture can mean something different to me than it means to other folks. I'm going to give you some more statistics that help to illustrate what I'm talking about. Studies show that racism persists in America. People with black sounding names had to send out 50% more job applications than people with white sounding names to get a call back. A black man is three times more likely to be searched at a traffic stop and six times more likely to go to jail than a white man. If a black person kills a white person, he or she is twice as likely to receive the death, to receive the death sentence as a white person who kills a black person. Blacks serve up to 20% more time in prison than white people for the same crimes. Blacks are 38% more likely to be sentenced to death than white people for the same crimes. This goes on to say that racism persists in American churches as well. And folks, when I read these statistics, it made me uncomfortable. I think probably it'll make you uncomfortable too, but they're statistics I think we need to talk about. Only 32% of white pastors strongly agree that my church is involved with racial, racial reconciliation at a local level. 53% of African American pastors strongly agree with this statement. Only 56% of evangelicals believe that people of color are often put at a social disadvantage because of their race. Folks, only 56% of evangelicals who were polled in this believe that people of co color are often put at a social disadvantage because of their race. And perhaps you might find yourself in that same demographic there that you, uh, you haven't thought about it in that way. It goes on to say that 84% of blacks agree with this statement. So 84% of blacks agree that people of color are often put at a social disadvantage because of their race. 56% of evangelicals believe that. A recent study showed that 81% of America's Protestant churches are composed of one predominant racial group. While 90% of Protestant pastors say their congregation would welcome a sermon on race a sermon on racial reconciliation. Let me say that again, I wasn't super clear. 90% of Protestant pastors say their congregation would welcome a sermon on racial reconciliation. Only 26% say leaders in their church have encouraged them to preach on the subject. 90% of pastors like myself think that their congregations would wanna hear this sort of sermon and they say 26% of leaders in the church have encouraged them to preach on the subject. That's a pretty big gap between percentages there on that statistic. Folks, as I thought about those statistics and I thought about a lot of different things over this last week and I've struggled with them, I've lost sleep over them, I've tried to figure out that a person who sits in the chair that I do as a pastor, what is it that we do with this? How do we move forward? And folks, I've heard many of these statistics, and I'm sure you have too, hundreds of times before. I've taken numerous classes. I've read numerous books. I've studied news articles and statistics on racial injustice and the difficulty black and brown folks face. I have visited the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis and stood feet from where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died. In all of these attempts to study and enlighten myself, to try to be a better advocate for racial justice, to have a knowledge base that could open the doors to reconciliation, I still didn't and probably still don't get it. I don't understand what black and brown folks go through every single day. I can't get it and understand completely because I can't see the world through the lens of black and brown folks because the only lens I have and know is one of white privilege. And folks, yes, I sit in a place of white privilege. I am a white middle class person who is fairly economically uh, in, in a good position to thrive. And I look at things from that position. And it's tough for me to look at it from any other way because I don't know any other way. So it's hard for me to understand what others go through on a daily basis that I don't.
So recently, as I make that statement, for whatever reason, after seeing countless killings, many of them on video, seeing countless abuses, countless cries for justice that go unheeded, and finally seeing the video and hearing the cries of George Floyd as he literally died in front of my eyes. After seeing that, I can't in good conscience let it go without talking about it. I can't stop and let that go without talking about what we do as Christians to respond to something that is clearly evil. It's clearly evil. And it's clearly against what we know of Jesus Christ. And it's clearly against the teachings that we as Church of the Brethren folks hold so dear in our New Testament. Not everybody may agree with my position on this, but as I look at it from my perspective as a pastor and somebody who has a lot of ears at my disposal on a Sunday morning, it's my responsibility to try to help you think about things in a little different way. It's my responsibility to try to lift up some of the voices we've been hearing and figure out what it is we as Panther Creek Church of the Brethren can do to move forward and to be an active force in reconciliation and racial justice. Now, I don't have all the answers, but I think that as we look at some of this and we talk about some of this this morning, if you're able to stick with me, there's a lot to learn, and I think that the Bible will point us in the right direction for what it is that we do next. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I've been thinking about my response when I hear folks talk about racial injustice. I see racial injustice. I've had to wonder if it's time for me and us to stop just hearing what the black and brown community is telling us and, it's time, and whether or not it's time for us to actually listen and act. And folks, I think it's time. I know that in the past I've heard what's being said, but I haven't really listened. I haven't really dug down and looked at it and thought about it the way I should have to listen to what they're telling me, to listen to what they're asking for, and to listen for what they need from us what we can do to help if we really want to. And I really think we should. I read a book when I was in seminary and I took a class that was amazing dealing with, uh, with racial injustice and it dealt from it from largely a historical perspective. But in that book, um, it's um, James Cone's book, Martin and Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare. And I can show you what that looks like. It looks like this right here. And I read that book for a class, man, 15 years ago. And I just got it out in my office as I was thinking about this sermon. And I opened it up and I came to something that immediately um, I thought was something I needed to share with you. And it is a quote from uh, Dr. King. And it's about church. And let me get to that here and read this to you. And I think it's, uh, it's really, really prominent. And in this particular context, he was talking to the black church, but also the white church. So he was talking to both groups when he, when he, uh, when he said this. And he said, there's something wrong with any church that limits the gospel to talking about heaven over yonder. There's something wrong with any minister who becomes so otherworldly in his orientation that he forgets what is happening now. There's something wrong with any church that is so absolved in the hereafter that it forgets the here. Here where men are trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. Here where thousands of God's children are caught in the airtight cage of poverty. Here where thousands of men and women are depressed and in agony because of their earthly fight, where the darkness of life surrounds so many of God's children. I say to you that religion must be concerned not merely about mansions in the sky, but about the slums and the ghettos in this world. 
A proper religion will be concerned not merely about the streets flowing with milk and honey, but about the millions of God's children in Asia, Africa, and South America, and in our own nation who go to bed hungry at night. It will be concerned not only about a long white robe over yonder, but about people having some clothes down here. It will be concerned not merely about silver slippers in heaven, but about men and women having some shoes to wear on earth. Folks, as I read those words, I, uh, I get goosebumps uh, thinking about the meaning and the intention here. Another thing that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said and um, probably was right about is that Sunday morning worship services are still the most segregated hour in America. Let that sink in for a little while. So, our churches, and I agree wholeheartedly that we need to think about salvation. We need to think about what comes next. And that's an important thing for us to spread and give to folks. But if we get so focused on that that we forget about the here and now, we forget about this earth, we forget about what's happening here and now in our country and in cities all over our country, if we can't hear the voices of the here and now and we can't understand that our reality and the black and brown folks who are trying to get us to hear them, that their reality are two different things, then folks, I have some concerns that we're missing the point. And the Bible, as you'll find out shortly, is with me on this. So what do we do? Well, as good Christians, there are a couple things that we always do. We get into our Bibles, we read them, and then we put them to use in our everyday lives, and we pray. Those are two of the things that we can always do when we're struggling with something. So I'm going to get us into the Bible a little bit today, and I'm going to read an article that I found. And uh, I think that it's a really good one that gives us some um, good ideas about where the Bible's at when it comes to social justice and racism. And this article was written by Dr. Jim Dennison. First, he says, we're all created by God. That was a scripture I was supposed to read and go over with you today. We're all created from God. Even when you look at various interpretations of Genesis, the literal interpretation is that Adam and Eve were the first person here. and We all descend from them. So we were all created by God. And I might add that not only were we all created by God, we were all, all of us, every single one of us created in God's image. Whether we look the same or not, we were created in God's image. That's right off the bat, Genesis 1. We are all created. Denison says every person is created intentionally by God in his own divine image. Thus, every person is sacred and equally valuable. Every form of racism by definition is to be rejected. Two, we're all descended from the same parents. Every human being is descended from Adam and Eve, Genesis 1.28. As a result, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living, Genesis 3.20. As scripture notes, the Lord made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, Acts 17.26. Because of the flood, all of humanity can trace our ancestry to Noah as well, Genesis 9.1. Three, every person is equally valuable to God. As noted earlier, Paul stated boldly, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. I hope you guys have out a piece of paper. I'll try to make sure to slow down um, and let you write down some of these scriptures if you'd like to take a closer look at them yourself. We understand the context behind that because the Gentiles were persecuting a lot and were persecuted a lot during this time. And Paul is trying to get across that we're all one in God and we need to take care of each other. That's a whole sermon and you'll hear it from me at some point because uh, that's one of the ones that I really like to, to preach. As I said, it's one of my favorite scriptures. But in the context that we're looking at it in now, in today's world, I think it takes on... A different meaning and we need to pay closer attention to it. Galatians 3.28, as, uh, as it's put, sounds the clarion call that every form of racism known to Paul's day was invalid and sinful. The God who made us all loves us all. 
Paul repeated this assertion in Colossians. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all, Colossians 3.11. To summarize, God shows no partiality. And if you don't believe me, read Acts 10.34. Four, each person is equally welcome to salvation in Christ. God loves all sinners and wants all to come to faith in his son. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Our Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. And Paul noted God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. That's why the apostle could testify, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, Romans 1, 16. Our Father's love is available to all. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, Romans 10, 12. His grace is universal, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. When we trust in Christ, we become one people. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, Ephesians 2, 14. As a result, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Jesus is also a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. You can find that in 1 John 2.2. 2. Peter told his fellow Jewish Christians that God made no distinction between Gentile Christians and us, having cleansed their hearts by faith, Acts 15.9. As a result, we're to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28.19. Nations translates to ethnos, meaning people, groups. We get ethnicity from this word. Every person of every ethnicity is to be brought to Christ through the ministry of the church. Every single one. Five, all people will be equally valuable in paradise. John was given this vision of heaven. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7, 9. And this isn't mentioned in this article, but if you look at Revelations 22, right at the beginning, you'll find that in the New Jerusalem, there is a river. And on the other side of the river, there are trees. And those trees have 12 kinds of fruit. And those fruits are for the healing of the nations. Not for us, but for the healing of the nations. All of them. Six. I think we know this one. We're to love all people unconditionally. God's word is blunt. If you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. James 2.9. Partiality translates into prosopolemsia, meaning to show favoritism or prejudice, to treat one person as inherently better than another. Such prejudice is sin. Period. God told his people, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19.34. Jesus taught us, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. Matthew 7.12. We are to love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22, 39, quoting Leviticus 19, 18. Peter testified to the Gentiles who sought to hear the gospel. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean, Acts 10, 28. Folks, I got to tell you, this is not an exhaustive list. But I can say with certainty that the Bible is clear on what we as Christians are called to do when it comes to people who are different than us. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? 
Why do we struggle so mightily to rally around our brothers and sisters of all colors and love them as we want to be loved by them, to help them as we want to be helped, to walk with them, to march with them, to hear them, to listen to them as we want them to hear, listen, walk, and march with us? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard and so uncomfortable for us to take up this mantle of justice for people who clearly aren't receiving it? I was talking with my wife, Kara, and we were talking about trying to teach the kids about what is happening right now in our world, what's going on, what's happening with the rioting, what's happening with the peaceful protests. We're trying to help them understand what all of this is about and what it means to peacefully protest and why all of these things matter. I'll tell you, it puts racism in stark contrast when you have to teach your children about it and you have to examine your own biases, your own inaction, your own struggles to listen and hear what black and brown folks have been telling us for centuries. I think this conversation with my wife and the eventual one I'll have with my kids in conjunction with George, Floor, George Floyd's murder brought home a reality I had never had to or maybe was too uncomfortable to address. That reality is this, and it comes from a place of empathy as a parent and something that no matter what color or race you are, you care about your kids and you want what's best for them. And in this conversation with Kara and in thinking about this, I can't imagine what it must be like for black and brown families to have to teach their kids how to be safe when they leave the house every day. How they have to teach their kids how to be safe if they get stopped by the police. How they need to be safe when they're out for a simple jog. How to be safe at school how to be safe when driving their car, how to act when confronted and mistreated. I never have had to worry about any of these things in my life when I leave the house. And I don't have to worry about them for my children. I have a lot of things I have to worry about for my children, but none of the things I just mentioned are among them. And I take that for granted that every single day when I walk out of my house and when my children walk out of their house, that they have a different reality than folks who are black and brown have in this country and in this world. They have a different reality because they were born to look the way they do. They were born to look like Kara and I, and they don't have half of the worries that are black and brown brothers and sisters have. And folks, it breaks my heart and it makes me almost sick to my stomach to think of that in this context. And you know what? I hate it. I hate it that it's taken me this long to get there. And folks, I still don't understand. I'm still not all the way there. I still can't relate completely with what's happening. But I certainly, when I think of it in the context of my children and what other children in this country have to go through and that their reality is completely different than that of my children, it breaks my heart. And it leads me to a place where we need to do something about it. We need to try. We need to step up and figure out how to no longer be silent. Because it breaks my heart to think that I'm perpetuating more injustice with my silence. I wish I had more answers. I wish I could make all of this better. But the bottom line is I can't, at least not by myself. It's time for us as a church family to step up and put ourselves out there to seek out conversations with our brothers and sisters who live out a different reality than us. It is our job to share our love for them through listening, not just hearing. To share our love for Christ with them, to pray with them, to walk with them, to seek justice together, and to work towards peace through a genuine willingness to have a relationship. To try our best to wrap our heads around the fact that we live in a country with multiple realities, and those realities are based on the color of the skin you were born with. If that makes you uncomfortable, if that makes you want to stop listening right now, then I would urge you to search your heart and mind and ask the question, why? Because until we answer that question for ourselves, 
we won't be able to listen and act and deal with the uncomfortable process that change requires. Folks, if we can't figure out a way to assist in fighting for the rights of our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, our black and brown communities, regardless, if we can't figure out a way to assist in making their lives better, if we can't open ourselves up to hearing what they're trying to tell us and acting accordingly, if we can't do those things, folks, I fear we're missing the point. I fear we're missing the point. I fear we're missing the entire point of the Bible. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I feel that if we can't get our minds wrapped around this and not only talk about it, not only read our Bible and pray about it, if we can't get out there and do something, folks, I worry that the Bible just becomes a prop. And that is the last thing in the world that I want the greatest book in history to be in our hands. Folks, if we read that book, we have to act. We have to get out of our comfort zones and we have to be willing to listen and do what we can to help. Because folks, it is an awful reality to live in knowing that there are multiple realities in this country and we're not doing a darn thing about it. I'm gonna leave you with this quote. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality, said the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his Nobel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. You know what? I believe that too. I believe that because I have faith in us. I have faith in our church community and our brothers and sisters to understand that through unconditional love, through our knowledge of the Bible and our love for Jesus Christ, that we can make things better. We can change a reality because if we live our lives in the way that we're supposed to, in the way that Jesus lived his, we can't help but have unconditional love for our black and brown brothers and sisters in this world. And folks, I implore you, I know it's hard, I know it's uncomfortable, I know it's not fun to think about and to search inside ourselves to figure out where we've gone wrong, what biases we have, what struggles we have. But I implore you to search deep in your hearts to work through some of the discomfort you feel. And while you're working through that discomfort, think about what brown and black folks are dealing with on a daily basis that you don't have to. I pray that we as a Christian community can not only read our Bible, but act on it, that we can get out there and that we can show folks what unconditional love of Jesus Christ looks like and we can work to change reality together. I have hope, I have hope, I really do, that that can happen. But folks, having hope and making the change that's necessary are two very different things. I think we're gonna have to work hard to have that hope and to bring that hope to others. Amen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. 
We will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love.